Okay, guys, I invite you to take your Bible and turn to Exodus 20. Uh, you guys know where we're at tonight, and we're going to pick up immediately after the Ten Commandments. And so uh, many of you guys have been with us. You've been faithful as we've looked at all ten of the Ten Commandments. And so now uh, we're going to talk about um, what happened directly after. So I want to read the passage first, and then we'll dig in and explain. Exodus chapter 20, verse number 18. Let's begin reading in verse 18. The Bible says this, Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, and the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off, and said to Moses, You speak to us, and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us, lest we die. Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of Him may be before you, that you may not sin. Now notice verse 21. It says, The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. So let's stop right there for just a second. Uh, So I want to share with you a uh, story. Uh, Many of you guys, if you completed your Bible reading plan this year, uh, you were given a copy of a book uh, entitled The Pilgrim's Progress. It was written by a man uh, named John Bunyan. Now you're like, well, who's John Bunyan? Now, John Bunyan's not the same guy as uh, Paul Bunyan. You guys know who Paul Bunyan was? The, lumber, the huge lumberjack guy with the blue ox. Uh, you guys know who I'm talking about? These are two different guys. Paul Bunyan and John Bunyan are two different guys. So John Bunyan, the guy that wrote this book called The Pilgrim's Progress, he, I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of background on this book because it's helpful as we study our lesson tonight. So, uh, in this story called The Pilgrim's Progress, the main character, the main man's name is Christian. Now, Christian goes on this journey, and and Christian, this man, journeys from the city of destruction, and he's seeking to journey to the celestial city. Sounds a lot like the Christian faith, right? Right? Sounds a lot like our life. We're in the city of destruction. We're in this world and we're journeying to the celestial city, to heaven. Well, along the way, as Christian is is journeying, this pilgrim is journeying, he meets a man by the name of Evangelist. And Evangelist tells Christian that in order to get to this city, you've got to follow a particular path. The name of this path is salvation. And so Christian asked about, because as he's journeying, he has this huge pack on his back. And this huge pack on his back was sin and fear of judgment. And so he's, he's journeying to the celestial city. He meets evangelists. The evangelist tells him the way to go. And he tells him, that this burden can be taken off of his back while he's traveling by going the way of salvation. So he starts out. He's headed in that direction. But then he meets another man. And this other man says, Hey, you want to get rid of that that load off of your back? Don't take the the way of salvation. Don't, Don't do that. In fact, I want you to go see another guy. And so this man's name was, let me make sure I get this right, Mr. Legality. And Mr. Legality lived in the city of morality. Now, Mr. Legality told Christian, hey, you want to get rid of your burden by sin? What you need to do is keep God's law. Don't don't follow the path of salvation. Instead, do things. Just hike up this huge mountain. And so instead of journeying this narrow road to the celestial city, instead of following salvation, he takes a detour on the path. He thinks, hey, I can get there a little quicker. I can get this load off my back if I just keep God's law. So then he goes and he takes this detour to this huge mountain of morality. And listen to what John Bunyan says. This is, this is straight from the book. The book says, He turned out of his way to go to Mr. Legality's house for help. And behold... When he got now hard by the hill, it seemed so high. So he turns off the path, 
and this mountain is huge. He's like, how am I ever going to get across this? It said that mountainside hung so much over Christian that he was afraid to, to journey upward anymore. He was afraid that the hill would actually fall down on himself. So he's like literally walking up and it's almost like he's upside down. Then he stood still and knew not what to do. Also, his burden on his back seemed to be heavier now on this way. There came also flashes of fire out of the hill that made Christian afraid that he should be burned. Here, therefore, he sweat and he toiled, and he quaked for fear. For fear. Now, John Bunyan doesn't tell us the name of this hill, but, but when we read here in Exodus 20, we probably got a pretty good idea. This, this character in this story is probably trying to journey up Mount Sinai. And so, again, uh, if you, if, has anybody read the book or even watched the movie? Let's be honest. All right, so the boys have, uh, Mr. Denny has. Well, in this book, you'll, and I encourage you to watch the movie if you're not a reader, because he strayed off the path, he was hoping it would relieve his burden, it actually ended up adding his burden. Burden. God's law, all this stuff, it didn't, it didn't relieve his burden. It just added to it. It added frustration and pain. It made, it, it made his load heavier. So, and it made him afraid. Now here's your little fill in the blank before we go on. And we're about to get to Exodus 20. The law does not ha have the power to save but only to threaten us with judgment and show us our need of salvation. So there's your two blanks, law and salvation. Now, number one on your paper says the terrors of law and of God. You see, when we get to Exodus 20, the Israelites probably felt the very same way that Christian did in the Pilgrim's Progress. The Israelites, whenever they get to this mountain, Mount Sinai, and, and God delivers His instructions, hey, this is the standard. These ten laws, this is how you're to live. Like, like Christian in this, in this book, they're fearful. Like, I can't do this. The same way, that's how the Israelites responded. God set a standard. Hey, if you want to inherit eternal life, if you want to be in a relationship with me, you've got to keep all ten of these. This is my perfect, holy, righteous standard. And the Israelites are like, wait a second. How can I do this? There's no way. I've already, I've already broken these laws. So again, imagine in your minds. Look at verse number 18. Exodus 20, verse number 18. It says, now when all the... This is directly after God's finished giving the Ten Commandments. This is what the people did. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and they, were, and they trembled and they stood far off. So here is God delivers the Ten Commandments. And imagine being an Israelite in this moment. Like you're looking up at the mountain and the mountain's literally smoking. And you hear all this, this thunder and your feet are literally moving. One, because you're afraid, but two, because the thunder and the lightning that's taking place. And then out of nowhere, you hear these huge loud trumpets. And why is all this taking place? Because of the holiness of God. All, all this is taking place and people are scared. Now, the thunder, the lightning, the smoke, the, the trumpets. Have we heard of that before? Many of you guys have been here for weeks and weeks and weeks. Have we heard of this happening before in Exodus? All this natural phenomenon? Have we heard of this happening? Yeah. In fact, hold your place there in Exodus 20 and go back to Exodus 19, verse number 18. The Bible says this, Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire, the smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him in thunder. So, okay, so we've heard of this happening before. Crazy natural phenomenon is, is taking place here in Exodus. And now it's happening again. Now, this question is on your paper. Why does the Bible describe thunder and lightning both before and after giving the Ten Commandments. Why does the Bible do that? Why does it describe it 
before and after. Why would the Bible include this? Right. You're exactly right. And, and I would submit to you guys exactly what Miss Margaret is saying. But I would also add, this thunder and this lightning continued the whole time. So it never led up. The whole time God's giving the law, it's continuing. It's con- uh, the whole time God is giving the law. The reason why Scripture mentions it again in chapter number 20 is that it's shown how the Israelites responded to all this thunder and lightning. And now like Exodus 20 verse 18 says, when all this is happening, what did the people do? They stand far off. Like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about this. Now why were the Israelites so frightened? Why were they afraid? Right. I think those are the top two reasons why these folks are fearful. I think there's another reason, though. I think these people are frightened because of what the law demanded. At this point in their life, in the life of the Israelite nation, God is demanding complete, total allegiance to Him. What I mean by that is God's requiring them to worship Him alone. He's requiring them to love each other and everything that they said and, and do. In every area of their life, God say, hey, you've got to be faithful. And they're fearful of that because they know, I, there's no way I can do this. Here's a little fill in the blank. God was making an absolute claim on their worship, their time, their relationships, possessions, their bodies, their speech, and also their desires. This is pretty interesting. If you were to go back to uh, chapter 19, verse number 8, so God's literally delivered the Israelites from Egypt, and they're like, hey, Lord, we're going to do whatever you tell us to do. Whatever you tell us to do, we're faithful. You just say it, and we'll do it. And so the Lord's like, okay, Moses, come up here. I want to give you my word. These folks say they're going to do it. And so here it is. So, so they're like, yeah, I, I want to do it. But then they receive God's law, and what do they do? They start panicking. Once they find out what else included, and doing what God said, they, they start becoming fearful. Notice number two on your paper. We need to continue on because one of the most important time that we have tonight is applying. What, what's this have to do with us? So notice number two, it says the mediator. Let me ask you guys a question. What's the first thing a person does when they break the law? All right, just think about society. What's the first thing that's... What's if, if you've ever got caught up and you've done something unlawful, you don't have to tell me that what you did, but, but what's the first thing most people do when they break the law? All right. Okay, this isn't what I, I didn't want to know these answers. The first thing most people do whenever they get in trouble with the law is hire a lawyer, right? So they're wanting somebody to help, help them in their situation. You guys that said hide, I know where to come find. <laughs> We're not even going to ask. Well, guys, listen. In this moment, the Israelites have been given God's law. They know they're guilty of breaking God's law. So what did they immediately do? They decided to hire a lawyer. Uh, that's exactly what the Israelites did here on Mount Sinai. So they asked Moses to be their legal advocate. They asked Moses to be their mediator. In fact, look at verse number 19. So they stood far off and they asked Moses, hey, hey, you speak to us and we will listen. But but don't let God speak to us lest we die. So what are they doing in that moment? They're trying to hire a lawyer. (laughs) They want Moses to be their advocate. Now, they didn't want to, why do you think they didn't want to deal with God directly? Yeah, you're exactly right. So they they were fearful. Um, And for obvious reasons, right? Miss Debbie's exactly right. Like, we should be fearful to go to this righteous judge. We need somebody to mediate for us. So let's ask another question. This is on your paper. What is a mediator? Yeah, so you guys are exactly right. That is a mediator. A mediator is someone who stands in the gap 
So they bring two parties together. In this situation, someone was going to be a mediator between heaven and earth. Someone was going to be a mediator between sinful man and a holy God. But what the Israelites didn't realize is they didn't have to ask Moses to be their mediator. God had already initiated Moses as their mediator all the way back in the burning bush. God had already set someone aside to mediate for them. Now, as we go on, and, and this is important, I want you guys to see all the dynamics of this passage. I want you to see, hey, here's God's holy law. I want you to see a sinful people and the need for a mediator. But now let's dig into this mediator thing for just a, a few minutes. If you notice in verse number 20, there's two things that the mediator did here in Exodus 20. There's two things that Moses did as a mediator. It, it was required of him. What's the first thing that Moses did as a mediator? He spoke to them for God. So as a mediator between two parties, Moses received from God, and then he went and spoke to the people. That's, that's the first thing that Moses did as a mediator. L look at verse number 20 and we see this. Uh, the Bible says this, Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the, that the fear of Him may be before you, that you may not sin. So Moses has a message from God, from the just judge, he takes that message and he interprets the law and he gives it to the people. That's the first job of a mediator. Uh, in fact, next to verse number 20 in my Bible, I wrote down Deuteronomy 5.5. Uh, 5. Because later on, as time goes on, this is what Moses would say. He said, I stood between the Lord and you at that time to declare to you the word of our Lord. For you were afraid because of the fire and you did not go up on the mountain. So again, the mediator met with God. They needed somebody to do that. And then Moses, as a mediator, took what God said and interpreted it and, and helped explain it to them so that they understood the law. Moses spoke for God so that these people could hear and obey. Think about a lawyer today. I mean, he does the same thing. When you hire a lawyer, you're wanting somebody to be able to tell you and to explain to you things. That's what I would want. Same case for Moses here. So not only did Moses speak to them for God as their mediator, number two, he went for them to God. So he didn't just associate with this party. Moses came over here and, and associated with the people and then went to God on behalf of the people. Look in verse number 21. We'll see where this happens. So again... Moses did for the people what they couldn't do for themselves. Verse 21 says this, The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. So, uh, who was the only one who could stand to enter the thick darkness of God's presence? Who was the only one that was able to go in? You're exactly right. He was the only mediator. There was only one. Now, this is what a mediator does. You guys may be tempted to just check out, but I'm telling you, this is rich. The more we study about Moses as a mediator, the more we can glorify and praise the Lord for the mediator that he would be. So again, let's think through Moses, and then we'll get to Christ. So this is what a mediator does. A mediator, this isn't on your paper, he draws near to God as a representative. Moses did that. He faithfully represented the people to God. A mediator also goes where no one else dares to go. Moses did that for the people. He went into the, to the presence of God. Nobody else wanted to. They said, hey, you go do this for us. A mediator also makes atonement for sin. That was one of the jobs of Moses as a mediator. Also, a mediator lays down his life for the people that he serves. Did you guys know that Moses did that as well? He was willing to lay his life down for the Israelites. He did all these. Let me give you an example of that last one. Did you guys know that Moses laid down his life? Or he wanted to lay down his life for the people? Write down the scripture reference. Exodus 32, verse number 32. So what happened along the way is uh, the Israelites decided to start worshiping a golden calf. 
Wait, what? Like the Lord's delivered them for me, and now their hearts are turned. Whenever Moses, as a mediator, intercedes for God's people, listen to what he says. Now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. Moses was willing to give up his life for the people. Now, let's keep going. So whenever we come to the Ten Commandments, most people say, yeah, I understand them. So a lot of people understand after we've read through and studied the Ten Commandments, okay, I, I'll tell you where I landed. I'll, I'll be personal for just a second. So I, I'd read through the Ten Commandments. I'd been taught the Ten Commandments as a kid. You know, you have to write them out. You sing songs about the Ten Commandments. You, you see them on Sunday school posters. Yeah, okay. But whenever we comb through these Ten Commandments as a church these past few weeks, I found like there's a lot of things I didn't ever even realize. Like it goes so much deeper. And so you're probably in one of two camps tonight. One, realizing, man, I'm so thankful for Jesus because there's no way I could live up to all these Ten Commandments. I've broken every single one of them. I hope that's where you're at tonight. But there's also another camp of people whenever you come to the Ten Commandments and you say, well, I know the Ten Commandments. I'm not, I'm not that bad off. I mean, I haven't, I haven't done this. I haven't committed adultery or I, I don't covet my neighbor's house or I've never murdered anybody. I'm pretty good. But what we need to see in this passage is that it doesn't matter how hard you try. It doesn't matter how hard you try with the Ten Commandments. You're never going to fully obey them. What I mean by this, if, if you set out on your own to keep the Ten Commandments, you're going to fail. I, and, and you're going to fail really bad. There's no way that you can climb this mountain of morality. You're going to become exhausted. You're going to become burdened. There's no way on your own you're going to make it. It's impossible to keep the Ten Commandments. Why? Because we're sinners by nature. We're sinners by profession, and we're sinners by birth. Our hearts are bent from birth on breaking these Ten Commandments. I want you to think through these Ten Commandments with me, just a few of them. I want to show you just how utterly we fail in keeping the Ten Commandments. So, you look at these, these Ten Commandments. I'm just going to name a few of them. One of the Ten Commandments is to remember the Sabbath day. How are we doing with that? Like, do we set aside one day a week that is holy the Lord's? That, that's His day. How consistently do we do that? Like, again, every single one of us in this room, including myself, have broken that commandment. Let's, let's keep going. Honor your father and your mother. Have we done that? How many times have we disobeyed our parents or even our authority? Every single one of us have disobeyed authority at some point in our life if we're not still doing it. You shall not commit adultery. How many times, if, if you look over the course of your life, you set your eyes on someone and, with lustful intent? So again, People have broken this command. You shall not steal. Has there ever been a moment in your life where you've taken something that didn't belong to you? Even if it was, even if it was something small? Yes. The point is this. Whenever you look at the Ten Commandments for what they really are, like every single one of us have probably broken every one of these Ten Commandments numerous times, if not daily. So if this is God's standard, the Ten Commandments, hey, you've got to perfectly keep these Ten Commandments in order to receive eternal life, we look at that and we think, man, like our response to the Ten Commandments should be just like the Israelites and say, hey, I need an inter intercessor. I need, I need a lawyer because I messed up. It would be wrong for us to look at the Ten Commandments and think, hey, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that and God's going to be proud of me. That's not the response that we need to have when we look at the Ten Commandments. Instead, we should be trembling with fear. 
That was number four on your paper because I want to keep going towards an application. What we need is a good lawyer because the law leads us to the gospel. Now, I want to, uh, I want to catch up. There's two fill in the blanks that I didn't touch on. I need to I need to talk about. If we try to keep God's law on our own, we are doomed to failure and frustration. This is what the Bible says. In Romans 3, verse number 20, it says, By works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. James chapter 2, verse number 10 says this, Whoever keeps the whole law but fails at one point has become accountable for all of it. So you may say, well, I haven't broke this or this or this. The Bible says just by one sin, you're guilty. Just by breaking one of them. So again, the law cannot save us. God's told us what we need to do, but the problem is we can't do it. So again, we need a good lawyer. Here's your next fill in the blank, because I want to keep going. The law condemns us for our sin so that we start looking for some kind of legal remedy. And then we discover that God has provided one for us in Christ Jesus. Jesus can do for us what the law cannot. The Bible says this in Romans 8, verse number 3, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending His Son. The New Testament teaches us that the Son of God is our mediator. Our lawyer is not Moses. Our lawyer is Jesus. Does anybody know 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse number 5? This is a good passage. You need to memorize this one. For there is one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. That's a helpful verse that you need to, you need to memorize. So the good news for us is, here's the standard. God lays it out. This is what you need to do. We've all broken that standard. The good news for us is that we don't have to try to keep that. Like That's not where our hope is. Our hope is in this good lawyer who not only makes a case for us, he came and he lived those Ten Commandments out and he obeyed them perfectly. And we're going to get to that here in just a second. Again, I keep getting ahead of myself. Uh, Hebrews chapter 3, verse number 3 says this, Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 and 24 says, You have come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. So Moses is out. Christ is in. Jesus does for us everything that Moses did, but better. He is the better Moses. Just like Moses, God, just like Moses, Jesus goes to God for us. He approaches the thick darkness where God is. Jesus is unlike Moses because Jesus was fully God and fully man. So he's, be- he's able to represent us better than Moses. Jesus did something that Moses could never do. Jesus kept the law completely. Moses did not. Think about this. Think about all the Ten Commandments. And let's listen to how Jesus kept them perfectly. Jesus worshipped God alone. He fulfilled that commandment. Jesus honored God's name. He never broke that. Jesus kept the Sabbath day holy. Completely perfect. He never messed up. Jesus obeyed His parents. Jesus loved His enemies. Jesus told the truth. And He did everything else that God commanded Him to do. We needed someone like this as our lawyer and as our our mediator. Why? Because guess what? We didn't do all of those things. We didn't obey our parents. We didn't tell the truth. We're rebels and we're liars. We're idolaters. Every single one of us. We've all had lustful thoughts come into our mind. We've all broken every one of God's commandments. We're cheaters who can never be saved by our obedience. But the good news is this. Man, you're saying, Brother Travis, you beat me up this morning with suffering, and now you're telling me I'm not able to do what God tells me I need to do. But here's the good news. We need to hear this. Everything Jesus ever did counts for everyone who will trust in Him. And that is, that is good news. 
The bad news is you failed, but the good news is there's hope that Christ has provided a way. So we must trust in Jesus because guess what? His day of judgment is coming. The judge is coming, the holy judge, and he's going to hold a trial. And guess what? If you don't have a good lawyer, what's going to happen? You're going to face the punishment for the breaking God's law. If we do not have a lawyer, this is on your paper, we will have to face the justice of God's wrath all on our own. And what will happen to us then? It's not going to be good, right? There's something else that Jesus does. He's not only our mediator, He teaches us God's law. So whenever you come to Christ, a needy sinner in need of grace, you need help. You need legal help. You need a legal advocate. He not only makes a case based on His perfect obedience for you, He teaches you. So He relieves this burden of sin and guilt and judgment. So you're here. You're in this city of destruction. And as a believer, you're a pilgrim. This isn't your home anymore. You're traveling to, to your new home in the celestial city. As you are journeying, Christ has paved the way of salvation through Christ. You stay on the straight and narrow. It's a temptation for us to veer off towards morality and think, hey, if I do this, I'm going to earn favor with God. And all the while, it's burdened us down. But if we continue on the straight and narrow, if we're following the way of salvation, that load on our back, that burden of sin and guilt is alleviated. Christ did that for us. All the things, all the commandments that you've broken, all that that's weighing on your back, Christ done away with the condemning power of the law. The law... I need to talk about this before we go on. 1 Corinthians 9.21 says this, We are not outside of the law of God, but are under the law of Christ. So some people say, well, I don't have to keep the Ten Commandments anymore because I'm a Christian. That's, that's not true. Christ has done away with the condemning power of the law. And so now we're able to... Listen to this. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18 says this, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until it's accomplished. So what Jesus does for the Christian is He takes our burden off, and then He teaches us what these commandments mean. And now as a believer, we don't have to keep these commandments, but we do keep them because God's been so gracious to us. We keep this command, these commandments. Um, we keep these commandments not because we have to, but because we want to, and we're able to. Do you understand? Before, before Christ, you couldn't keep the Ten Commandments, but as a Christian with the Holy Spirit inside of you, now you can. The Lord enables us to fight sin, to, to fight those inward attitudes and desires through the Holy Spirit to say no. How, do, how does that happen? Because we've been liberated. We're set free. Before, our heart was bent on serving other gods. But Christ has now liberated us from idol worship where we can serve and, and worship the one true God. We've been delivered from hate. We no longer have to hate our brother. We no longer have to be jealous. Our lives have been exposed. We're now, now able to freely tell the truth. Because of our provisions and cross, there's no, no need for us to steal or to covet. Here's this, and then I want to ask a few questions. We have been saved by grace alone through faith alone in Christ Jesus. Guys, whenever you look at the Ten Commandments, again, just to be clear, I don't want you to set out on a hike to think, hey, I need to, I need to get to this pinnacle where I can keep all of God's laws. Because on your own, you're not going to be able to do it. You're going to become discouraged. But I hope you see that Christ came and He provided us hope. We can't attain God's standard on our own. Christ met that standard. And His life, the life He lived, is now credited to our account. He lived the life that we should have lived, but He died the death that we deserved. And so that's our hope. 
So let's go through a few questions. Does anybody have any questions so far?